do indeed welcome you this morning as we gather together in worship and what a great day and a blessed day to be together to to gather with the lord and so as we gather this morning i'm jeremy squires lead pastor here at good shepherd and we're so glad you're here and as we look at some things going on in our bulletin we also welcome those of you who are watching us online we have 25 to 35 people watching us online uh, all over the country every week so we wherever you're at post where you're from we'd love to see those towns where you're at and for those of you who are watching us from home from our own congregation here in the main campus hope you're doing well and we appreciate you watching a few announcements to make uh, first of all the safe sanctuary training and lunch is today let me make sure we understand clearly who this is for we've had several questions about this if you work with children and youth already it's for you if you would like to work with children and youth it's for you if you've ever been asked to work with children and youth and couldn't because you weren't safe sanctuary trained it's for you it's not a security thing it's nothing about that it's not about our front desk people it's about working with children and youth and so if you're a part of that or like to be a part of that then you need to be at this training because it keeps our kids and our youth safe so if you ever want to go on a trip with the youth you need to come to it so you can be able to be trained so that when someone when jared needs someone he can say hey you're on the list would you like to go with me on this trip to chattanooga to help out maybe my regular person can't help but i'm you know you're willing to step in if you're that kind of person it's for you because that way you're ready to go whenever it is that we might need you does that make sense am i clear so that's what it's for there's spots for 30 people and there's food and they look forward to seeing you at 12 30 for that tonight's sunday night serve and uh, so 4 30 tonight for that kim and her group men's barbecue and bible is september 2nd connect night for it's complicated our 30 20 30 something group is also starting and then we are closed on labor day of course as well you can see all the calendar and the things that are going on this week's menu is meatloaf smashed mashed potatoes corn nuggets salad and dessert and uh, the kids have chicken nuggets you need to once again decide whether your child will have the adult or the kids meal they can have the adult meal but we need to know which way you might go great group again this week it was exciting to see so many folks eating dinner together and then going to classes on our insert full of things and i don't know that i have the other piece of that you never got it right okay so we're going to save the date for life in the spirit seminar and we're going to have a video to show you next week it looks like and uh, so we'd love to have you be a part of this we're going to tell you more about it next week because i don't really have i want to go into detail what the video is going to do in the first place so uh, we'll just save that piece right there on the back side of it our go ministry is very busy this fall already first of all they are going to be hosting an ice cream social for the residents of sumner house in westington place all in our our our, our deal about getting out into the neighborhood instead of getting folks to come here we're going out to them they are very excited about this they're excited about the chance to be able to interact and the, and the uh, management of those places is very open to us being available to the residents of those two, uh, two uh, apartment complexes. So what we need from you is we need help. And so it's September 15th from noon to 2, and uh, you can talk to James Leisure more about that. And we're going to be serving ice cream, maybe have the largest uh, Sunday uh, kind of thing on those, you know, put in a, a gutter and that sort of thing. And uh, you have a big old Sunday like that, not really sure. And then uh, also, are you a veteran, active duty, you know of a deceased military GSUMC member? Uh, please take note of that. They are collecting names for that. There is, they're going to put a float in the Veterans Day Parade, and they'd love to be able to have those names. Talk to Shelley or James about that. So those are some of the things that are going on. And if you look at your connection, you see the prayer list every week and what's going on there as well. Our next sermon series is coming up in September called Discipleship. We'll start after Labor Day. And then also the yard sale and barbecue is coming in September. And as well as some other things in here you can look at and be able to see. One of the big things is if you're on Amazon buying stuff, you can help us out by going to smileamazon.com, signing up for Good Shepherd to be the place where your money goes, and you'll receive that. We've already received, you know, 50 bucks from it. 50 bucks is 50 bucks. And uh, so we'd love to have you do that. You can see more information about in there how to do that as well. Those are some of the things that are happening this morning as, as we get together. Some of you today may feel like you're a little bit late. Well, you weren't. The band's going to start playing about 840. 
just kind of get themselves warmed up and ready to go. Think of it as prelude music. And then after about 8.43, which has always been the case, they're going to start singing. Okay? That is soaking in music. Maybe you're in here for it, maybe you're not. You're not late for it. Worship doesn't start until 8.45. If you want to soak in, come a little bit early, do that. Here's the other piece that it is. It's the music that tells you when you're walking down the hallway, sauntering to get to worship, that it's time to actually get into worship. So by the time the song is over and I begin announcements, that's when worship really starts. So it just kind of soaks us in and gets us going. Whenever you hear it, just kind of know that the music starts to play. you got about three or four minutes to get into worship before we actually start going into things and that sort of thing. So just wanted you to know that, understand that, that that first song was never meant to be part of worship. It was always something just to gather people together and get them in because we need that kind of signal somehow to kind of remember, hey, something's starting to happen. So be here, be soak it in. If you're not, it's okay, you're not late. Uh, might be an announcements when worship starts. Just wanted you to know that. So just kind of, I don't want to give you that freedom though to say, hey, just show up when I start singing and when I start doing announcements. Come for the pre-soaking. Get yourselves ready for worship. Don't just rush in all the time and have to all of a sudden change gears. Just come in and let it all go and get soaked first in the spirit before we go into all the other pieces that happen. Otherwise, you're out of breath, you're running in. It's hard to really attach to God and get close in that moment. So some of those things that we, we, we celebrate today are birthdays. We always do this. We love celebrating birthdays. So we got any birthdays going on this week? Any birthdays? None. Anniversaries? Joy. Okay. Yes, Brittany, Brittany's birthday is tomorrow, but Brittany is sick, and so is Cassie. They are all sick, and uh, Brittany actually got to celebrate her birthday by going to a training and then getting sick while she's out of town on the training. So they're in the hotel room just going back and forth. Her and Katie are both sick. Uh, so please remember her on her birthday. Maybe she'll have a better birthday when she finally gets there. So, yeah, definitely. Give me something joyful that's been going on in your life. We got some pictures of different things. You can go ahead and say it, but I'll show pictures later on. What do you got? Yeah. Woo! That's great. <laughs> That's amazing. Th those of you who worked on that, would you stand up preparing the journey team? Would you stand up for those of you who worked on it? I, I want you to look at these folks, and there are others as well who aren't here in this service, but in the other service. But they've worked on this for a whole year. A whole year. And uh, in the midst of everything, you know, they felt like it wasn't coming together at times. People weren't signing up, including us, you know, that sort of thing. But then, you know, they just kept being faithful. They kept standing and just allowing God to use them, even when they thought maybe it was going to be a bust. And even at the end of it, they were saying, we're not going to do this again. It was great. We're not going to do it again. But I think pretty much that we understand and maybe we will do it again because of how powerful it was to everybody who was involved. The interesting part about the vendors was they said to me, they said, we never have a chance to ever be gathered together like this to show what we have to offer. If you don't know about elder care law and you don't know about the respite you can get for uh, caregivers, and if you don't know about uh, all the hospice options and it's more than just death and dying, I mean, there's so much there that was just amazing for everybody to be gathered together. And there were so many folks there who needed to be able to hear that message. So, And I appreciate all of you who signed up because there were a lot of us who were there yesterday to support. Whether you were there for the information or not, that's up to you, but you were there to support the team, and that's as important to me as it is the actual coming to this seminar. So I appreciate everybody who came out and did that as well. That was a great joy. And we got a few pictures later on to show as well about that. We do have one joy, though, of the seniors to senior uh, shepherds. Season shepherds went out. Well, you did that first? That's fine. You got them? There. They went to the Chapin Dinner Barn and Theater, watched the show, and uh, had a great time. They had 21 people that went out. And the exciting part was is that we were able to um, borrow the bus we've been test driving and be able to have that for them, which we didn't tell them until the last minute. So they were trying to scramble around, trying to find five cars to get everybody into. And then we, and then we, then we told Carolyn, we've got the bus. And they absolutely loved the bus. 
They enjoyed being on it and had a great trip. It rides wonderful. So do we have the bus yet? No, we do not. We still have to wait for the $10,000 grant. We hopefully will get from Golden Cross. If we don't get that, it's back to the drawing board. And so we have to be able to be faithful and to pray about that. And hopefully they're going to answer our prayers and to give us that money. Otherwise, we're going to figure something else out. But we don't own it yet, so don't, get your, don't put your hopes into it yet until we actually do own it. But they had a great time uh, using it. And if you were gone this summer and missed all this, missed the beard shaving, missed everything, haven't given anything towards this fund for raising the minibus, you're welcome to give towards it. We, will still, we still have need that will go towards that bus. So if you want to give towards it, We'd love to have that, and we'll definitely use it in some way towards that bus. So some amazing things that are going on during the course of this whole entire week. So, and hopefully some amazing things going on in your life too. But let's stand and greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome this morning. Shake off the cobwebs. No shaking or faking. There you go. You feel better now? Major day, right? Did I explain it good enough? Okay. Thank you for doing that. I know, she was. us to be. And so as you're making your way back to your seats this morning to continue in our worship, I just want you to be asking God what it is he has in store for you and how he's going to take you through that.
song in the second verse says, you're the one I seek, knowing I will find all I need in you alone. Um, and I think that just flows perfectly into the next song um, where the chorus says, your promise still stands. And just, I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. And I just think that's the just such a great thought to know that God makes us so many promises um, over and over and over again. And that those promises, he doesn't, he doesn't make them once, and then the next time he says, okay, I promise again. And then the next time, okay, I promise again. God makes us a promise, one promise, one time, and that is good through the rest of our lives. And that's just such a great thought to know that no matter what you do, if you mess it up one time, the next time he's like, hey, you still have that promise. I still gave that to you, and you can still rely on that. Um, and it's just so great to know that our God is just with us through our whole lives, and we'll see him do those same things for us over and over and over again no matter what we do or where we are and as we listen to this really beautiful bell melody at the beginning of this i just want you to center your hearts for worship and just just ask god what the promises are he's made for you and just thank him for those promises and everything he's done for you See you. 
much for us and you just you move the mountains and we see you do it over and over again God and we just you you make a way for us where there where we can't see any way at all and we just think we think there's no way we're going to get through what it is we're going through God but you always over and over again you bring us through it God and thank you so much for all you do for us and we pray that we never forget everything you've done for us throughout our whole lives and We'll just always be so grateful and so thankful for the love that you give us that we know we don't deserve, but you give us every day anyway. We just thank you, God, for us being here this morning to worship you and to learn more about you and be with Jeremy as he brings his message this morning and help us to open our hearts for whatever you have for us. In your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I just love that song confidence that we have that God has never failed us yet you know when you get in that slump and that place in your life when you're just feeling like you're just not feeling it and just don't have it together and just trying to figure out what to do next it's, it's amazing to know that even when you feel like you don't know God already has your back God's already present with you to walk through that that piece of your life and what you're struggling with the most and that's amazing and so God offers that to us, and, and, you know, we can't offer back that same thing at that same level, but we, we do our best to offer back to God our best. Of our, of our prayers and opportunities to be able to be in prayer for other people. A chance for us to, to write somebody down on a card if you want to write somebody down. A, a chance for us to be present in worship together. It's so funny because we, we talk about this all the time, but, you know, at the beginning of service, there's, you know, a trickle of us that are all here, that sort of thing. And then if I was to close my eyes and open them up five minutes later, all of a sudden it'd be like magic. It'd be like, poof, everybody's here. But there's a difference between that feeling of starting out and that feeling as we're coming together and the community begins to form and they gather all together. That's presence. The Spirit works through all of us. And the more of us there are, the, the more the Spirit has the ability to be able to work through more people who gather together up their prayers and their praise, and they raise it up to God. That's presence. That's why it's important to be together in community. Otherwise, we can all watch it live online at home. You ever watch it live online? It's good, but it's not great. Because there's nothing that takes the place of being together in a place of worship with the music together and everything else. So that's what we do this for. So we gather, and there's a blue pad that we choose to be able to write down and say we were here to worship God today. I ask you write down on that pad your, your name if you're a member. That's all we really need from you, unless you have a change of address or something. 
and to be able to pass that down. And if you're a guest with us and you're a first-time guest especially, we'd love to have some more information from you so we can welcome you. promise we're not going to hassle you. We have a no-hassle, no-haggle guarantee here. We just want you to feel welcome and to be in this place and maybe find a place to belong in your life. So pass that pad down your row and back again so people can be able to fill that out as part of their offerings to God this morning. Financially to give according to what God's given to us, to, to find ways to serve and to be faithful. And we've got a few pictures of, of that kind of going on. This is a few pictures from the Preparing the Journey uh, gathering. It was really great. It was awesome to see everybody there. And there were a lot of guests here and people looking for hope and answers. And there were lots of answers to be had. I, was, I learned lots of things yesterday that I had no idea about before I'd ever, you know, things I haven't thought about about how to help other people, too. You know, I never knew there was elder care law. I never knew that there was all those things I talked about. There's a new residential place opening up, the Clarendale. If you where that big building is behind McAllister's over there, that's a whole retirement living area. Whole new deal, unlike anything in this entire area. What are we going to do to reach out? We're going to sit back and let things be built, people walk, moving into our community and not figure out how to be able to, to, to go and spread the good news to them. We get a brand new bus sitting there. Shouldn't we take that bus out maybe on Sunday mornings and, and take it out to places like that and pick up residents and bring them so they can worship? That kind of stuff. That's how we serve and find our ways to go. And our witness, there was so much witness going on yesterday. I, I heard it from people speaking. Uh, Mitzi Baker did a fantastic job as our, as our keynote speaker. And, you know, she doesn't like talking in front of people, but she, she does when she's passionate, passionate. And she was very passionate yesterday. And it was, it was wonderful. We find our ways to do that. I, you know, we, 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 we find ways to be able to share that. I reloaded with love cards, so I'm ready to go. I'm ready to, to be able to do that. I was at Taco Bell on Friday morning, and, and I had a love card to give out to the person at Taco Bell. And, and I was talking to somebody on the phone. I said, just listen to what's going to happen now. So I put that person, just they're listening on my speakerphone while I was talking to the person at Taco Bell. And she's like saying, How, how's your day going? I said, my day's going great. How's your day going? She said, well, I'm having a great day. That is awesome. That's amazing. She's serving all the food and that sort of thing. And she's okay. I mean, you know, she's very friendly. Talk about over at Rivergate's really friendly in the morning especially. And uh, I gave her the card and said, you know, this means, you know, we want you to know that you matter and you're loved by God. And her face just lit up. And I said to the person talking to the phone, I said, see? I said, you can't see it. But she could hear it. She could hear the tone of the change. That's our job, folks. Make somebody's day better. That's our mission. That's our witness. You matter and you are loved by God. These are things we give to God this morning. And some of them fit in these plates, some of them don't. But they're all important, and God wants all of those things from us. So our ushers come forward to receive our morning's offering. If you're a guest with us, don't feel that you, feel income, uh, that you have to give compelled to. Your visit to us is a gift enough.
so rousing I'm still in it that is amazing <laughs> what a powerful song of God this morning God you hear this you hear these words coming from our lips from this new song to us and so we sing a new song to you help us to connect this day in worship in this place and to really feel your presence through each other and through you help us to grow to be able to to, to become fully devoted followers of you like like we're seeing happening on Wednesday night in small groups and, and people are getting together and they're, and they're digging into each other's lives and asking important questions and sharing. And help us to serve. Wow, it's amazing that, that all the things that are, that are out there that this church already does and all the ways individually we're serving in the world and how we're trying to make the world a better and a, and a, and a different place with your kingdom. And to go and spread the good news of that kingdom that, you know, this is not what we're called to do, to gather here in this place and somehow we praise God and that's the end of it. Or even worshiping together and leaving. You see, worship really happens outside of those doors. Worship happens when we're actually fully with God's people and we have the opportunity to be able to help someone else and to share good news of hope and peace and love. Then God smiles and says, you truly are worshiping me with your hearts and your lives. And so, Lord, though, in these moments in here, we're charging ourselves up. We're getting ready to go back out into a world that needs to know your love. And we're asking that you would use our prayers and our presence and financial gifts and service and witness and all that we have and all that we are to, to help us to be able to go forth from this place and to change the world in your name. So, Lord, give us that power now and send us on your mission. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask all these things. And the people of God said together, amen. I heard an amen already. Have a seat. Kids, said, hey, Cassie, you're alive. Well, that's awesome. I hope that you're, like, germ-free and I sprayed you down with Lysol before you go out. And then, Don't joke. I do that in our house. When I get sick, I'm like, don't cross this line. Is Alder okay too? Cassie, is Alder all right? Okay. Well, that's good. Now we hope Brittany will get, get well as well. Too many wells in that sentence. Hmm. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, center us this morning as we come into this last week of our sermon series, In Love. May the lessons from Ephesians we've been learning, may they be not only just things we're hearing and writing down, but also written down in our hearts. So now pour forth into these words to add to that about the, the armor of God and putting it on, what that means and what's the most important. So speak into our lives now in the place we need to hear these words the most. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And the people of God said together, amen. Show you a few pictures from uh, Flat PJ, James Leisure. Whenever I show pictures, that person isn't here. Italy. I went to Italy. It was great. I went to Rome. It's awesome. I've never been to Rome. So they took me to Rome. So can you imagine people like in these other countries and things when they see this picture of some weird guy in a Hawaiian shirt being held up, taking pictures of it, what it must mean? Yeah, that's beautiful. So they took me to Italy, so we wanted to see those. I've also been to Peru. Those are coming in. You'll see those later. And, of course, I've been to the Arctic Circle because Janice and Shirley are back with us, so welcome them back. If you get, they were gone for a year. I don't know. They are gone for a long time. They are gone for a long time. So the unofficial end of summer is right around the corner for us, and that is, of course, Labor Day. 
and in our families, in our schools, and in our church. We started a new year in many ways. We've had the kickoff. We've, we've done Wednesday night has begun again. Despite the fact neither the calendar year nor the liturgical church year even starts in September, our brains are wired into that idea that things begin anew in September. And like the end of summer, this week's passage about the armor of God serves as both the concluding summary of Paul's argument all the way through Ephesians, which hopefully you've read by now. And if you have, congratulations. That is awesome. If there's one book of the Bible you, you should read, it's Ephesians. And it's also the end of our sermon series. And it leads with a rousing call to action to move in love as we end. And so we find that in Ephesians 6, if you're going to follow along within your Bible app, I encourage you that if you're doing that, to be able to share, that you can take your notes in there, the YouVersion Bible app, and pull everything up. I put some great stuff this week about some details about some of the things I'm talking about, and I'd love for you to be able to follow along with that, or in your Bible in front of you, or in some other way. So the first 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. We're roused to action by the call to put on the whole armor of God. And you might have heard this passage before. It's a pretty familiar passage. And I have this in my my office, the actual full armor of God, it's really neat. I'm just kind of like looking at it and, and having it. I've always wanted one. And This is the kind of armor we're talking about. This is a Roman armor. You know, we see a lot of medieval knights and things like that. But that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about this. This is actually every piece of it right there. You're welcome to look at it after service. But, you know, as a kid, you know, when you do this kind of stuff as a kid, you always wanted, at least I did, I always wanted to be a knight, Right? Who doesn't want to do that? Who doesn't want to be a knight who can go out and slay dragons and do all kinds of stuff? And, and so usually, you know, back then, you don't have stuff like this. You have cardboard tubes, you know, aluminum foil over all your stuff, and you put your helmet on and everything else, and you go, and you, and you, and you want to do something powerful. You want to be, you know, someone who can save somebody and chivalry and all those things that go along with that because most of the time it's about being a medieval knight not being a roman soldier and so you know you think about those things you never kind of grow out of that of course i love i love that stuff that's one of the halloween costumes from one year but when we first got here now you know almost now you remember this so when we first got here actually we weren't even we were we were sort of here sort of not i guess it was the first hannah made this Five years ago, when we had, when Sean was our children's person, Sean Stanfield was our children's person, first time around, and they had the Armor of God kids series. Was it BBS that we did it for? Oh, so we did it for part of part of Army of God then, didn't we? Okay, that's why. That's why I was like, I knew we weren't here yet. We were just coming when they were doing BBS, and so she made this. So we still have this in our house. I don't know how it survived all these years, but it's it's been... It's been sitting there, and so it, it, it's made it. And, you know, donning armor was a sign you're getting ready to go into battle in the ancient days. And the very way in which this armor is described indicates it's prepare us for the work to which we've been called for. But Paul's going to make sure we understand it's not for going to war, like most folks would have known armor around Paul. But in order to understand this passage, we have to know how a soldier got dressed in battle for those times. So there's going to be a little bit of history today. So if you don't like history like my daughter, you just have to kind of hang on for a little bit every once in a while. Zone back in. Oh, okay, got another one there? Okay, all right. Just stay with me. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. It's okay. It's good. Verse 14 says, Stand firm, then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Because, for example, a soldier was able to secure the loose fabric of his tunic with his belt so that it would not be a hindrance or danger in battle. So donning a belt was a sign you're getting ready to go into battle. It was the first place to start, really. And then it says, with the breastplate of righteousness 
in place. Even the breastplate of righteousness draws on a reference to somewhere else in the Bible, which is what Paul is actually using. It's from Isaiah 59, 17, in which after observing grave injustice among his people and seeing that no one else is responding, God prepares to don the breastplate of righteousness and go down and take care of things. This is the God moment where he says, don't make me come down there. That's what Isaiah is talking about. And so Paul draws from that. And then verse 15, And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, the shoes with which we are instructed to put on our feet are shoes for mission, for going out, he's saying. And you see at the beginning of this sermon series, way back in the start of August, remember that? August, that was a long time ago, the start of August, I mean... We were in Ephesians 4, and we discussed the need to read Ephesians and all these texts critically against historical structures and culture and language of the Roman Empire, because Paul is writing in the Roman Empire, but he's against the Roman Empire. So when you invoke the language of armor, it can be dangerous, because it's been used for centuries to justify oppression and aggression towards our neighbor. We remember our own holy wars of the crusades where we thought it was actually put the cross of Christ on our shields and on our flags and slaughter people. And that was the way to bring others to know Jesus. So we can't forget our history that we thought that was a good idea. And there's a great little video that I attached in your YouVersion app you can look at later. It kind of gives you a 13-minute version of those four crusades. So when we think about that, we have to be very careful that we're talking about armor in a different way here because Paul isn't talking about it offensively like that. You see, we see it first going back to verse 15 because of what it says at the end. Look at verse 15 again. It says, the gospel of peace. This is not about war or getting ready for battle in the same way that people would have thought about putting on armor. See, the imperial stance of the soldier is literally undermined by feet fitted for the gospel of peace. Here's war, and then all of a sudden Paul talks about the feet bringing the gospel of peace. A peace which Paul makes very clear has been brought about in a different, different way from the Pax Romana. Pax Romana was the Roman peace. Roman peace was brought about by military might. They were very peaceful because if you go up against them, They'd kill you. Problem solved. Military law wins. Peace is established. But that's not what Paul's talking about. This is not a soldier standing ready for military battle, but a soldier standing ready to go out and spread the gospel. You see. Second, the passage from Isaiah 59 we mentioned serves as one of the primary sources for this imagery, but it... It also has in that passage references of God putting on garments of vengeance and fury as a mantle. Paul omits those in Ephesians. He hasn't mentioned anything about that. So even in using this biblical imagery, Paul once again is rewriting the grammar. There's that word again for those back in school. I'm so sorry if you don't like grammar, but there it is. Covering your ears, you don't like grammar? He's rewriting this again like he's been doing this whole time in Ephesians. He's rewriting the grammar of the whole armor of God by making these omissions. But that's not what he's talking about. And third, the language of putting on the armor of God invokes the baptismal language yet again. Every chapter, every time we've seen, Paul goes back to this idea of putting on the new clothes of Christ. This is new armor, not the same old armor. And there's a new self. For Ephesians 4.24, if you're wanting to write that down and go back and look at it. A self which is created in the likeness of God, marked by love and unity. So once again, notice that gentleness and patience and forbearance are the marks of the ethics of Ephesians. If you haven't gotten that by now, you need to write it down somewhere. These are the things. Gentleness, patience, forbearance, meaning forgiveness, are the marks of what it means to be a Christian. And the whole armor is put on in this case, not for protection, but rather for communication. 
Like we've seen before, that what Paul wants us to do is communicate love. And so almost every element of the armor is geared towards communication. Every element of it. The belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. That's right relationship. The shoes of proclamation. The shield of faith. The sword of the word. The whole metaphor of armor is inverted. Instead of something designed to protect the bearer, the armor of God is designed to engage the wearer with the ones that they're encountering. To have these things on you before you go out to spread the gospel. You get it? To be ready. In fact, the reference to the gospel of peace draws on Isaiah 52, 7, which you probably have heard this verse before, which says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Right? Feet. Paul's drawing on it. Is the one who bears the gospel of peace is a messenger. Communication. The whole movement of the description of the armor of God in verses 14 and 17 points towards something even more powerful than a piece of equipment or weapon now. All of these things together don't equal up to what he talks about in verse 18. And we're going to go back to the other verses too. But what he says in verse 18 is this, because this is important. After he does all of this, then he says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. What's the most important weapon, Paul says, that we have in our arsenal? Prayer. Of all these things, there are nothing that matches prayer, which is how he brings this whole thing together. The way it's written can suggest that we're to put on the armor with prayer. But you can't wear that armor without having prayer being involved in your life. Believe me, I know how hard that is. Prayer is not something that comes naturally to me first and foremost. But I can tell you that if you don't have it first and foremost in your life, your life will never be where it needs to be. You won't know it. But if you start praying, you will know it. And that's what he's saying. And he says, or maybe more intriguingly, maybe it's to consider prayer as another piece of the armor. Maybe he's really saying that you know, you've got all of that, but prayer is really another piece of your armor that you need to, need to have on to be able to communicate with other people. When people ask for, for prayers, and when you, when you see somebody hurting and you offer prayer to them, when you're in the restaurant and, you know, you don't want to, but you, you ask the server, you know, we're getting ready to pray over our meal. Can we pray for anything for you? And you're waiting to hear some horrible thing they're going to say like, no, you can never pray for me. And what they say to you instead is, yeah, my mother's dying. My son's struggling. I'm starting school this fall. I'm trying to figure out how to make it on what I make. I haven't heard one person who said to me since we started doing this, who's ever said to me, absolutely not, that's ridiculous, you've offended me. So prayer probably is the most powerful thing that you can offer anybody at any time for anything. And maybe it relates also back to verse 14 where it says to stand firm because praying is standing firm. Prayer is not, not, doing, is not just not doing something. It's standing firm. It's doing something. It's, it's being present in an active way. And either way, this is how the passage ends. It says, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Wow, what a, an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And so it all ends with the petition that the community pray for Paul so that he might communicate well. You see, Everything he's been talking about is about communicating. It's communicating positively. Communicating like Jesus would communicate. All the way through. And the instructions to pray at all times in the Spirit resonate not only with earlier chapters like chapter 2, but also 4.4, 4, 5.18. Once again, praying in the Spirit is throughout this whole text of Ephesians. 
as being an important thing. And then that in turn links back to last week's passage about singing. You see, we're coming full circle. Everything we've been talking about, it all goes together. That's why Paul's hard to read sometimes. If you try to read Paul in two verses, you're going to miss what he's trying to say. This is deep theology. This is the stuff that really makes who we are as Christians. Not the bumper stickers and things we can write in our mirror. This is the deep stuff. This is the bottom bedrock of what we're supposed to know as Christians. But it takes more than just a proof texting a verse or two in order to understand what Paul is trying to say the whole time. And so in the end, we're reminded that putting on the armor of God and everything before it is preparation for and service to proclaiming the mystery of the gospel. The armor is not about protecting us from something. It's about getting us ready to go do something, to move into something, to be able to go out and proclaim the gospel. A mystery we've already been told throughout Ephesians, the body, a new humanity in which all things are coming together under one Christ, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It goes all back to that. We are together under one. And this passage begins, though, I didn't skip that part. It begins with telling us where our power is from, where our strength is from. Verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. And then it goes on to tell you all the rest of the stuff. Strong with the Lord and his mighty power. It's the same phrase used in Ephesians 1:19 with the great unity is first described. We're to be empowered in the Lord. We're empowered together because we are one. There is more we can do than just individually. We do things together, and it's so much more. Repairing the journey couldn't have been done by one person, or even five people, even though they planned this. There was a whole team of folks who were there helping in some way. Feed the need definitely could not be done by one person. With a great idea. It requires all of us. Most things that we see that are so massive and so we feel are so powerful require all of us doing them together, not separately. Though there are great things that we do separately as well. And to be empowered in the Lord reminds us where we began this whole thing. Rewind it. We started off this whole thing singing the Beatles and talking about build up to build up others in love to be filled with gifts of love that Christ himself has bestowed upon us to building up the body spiritual gifts are given to us to be used for others not for ourselves they're the gift that if we don't know what our spiritual gifts are we leave unopened and Jesus looks at us and goes we gave you these you using them well I don't know what they are why don't you find out and I want you to know what they are and take that test or whatever else you're going to do don't just put in your notebook somewhere and go okay well, my spiritual gifts are this and then I, and then I ask people and they, I go how are you using them and they're like um, yeah I don't really know it's not enough to know them you have to use them they build up the body so even though Paul invokes an image of strength from the Roman military culture, that image is rewritten in order to serve what Paul is saying is true strength. True strength is not the Roman soldier dressed in their full garb with their sword and their shield. Paul says that true strength and how we're called to live and move is in love. I was watching a, 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 a Patriots Day a movie that came out about the Boston Marathon bombing in a couple years ago, and I finally get around to see these things when I, they get cheap enough and I buy them. And so I was watching it, and the one thing it said was, it was so interesting because this, this tied in so well, it said, you're never going to stop any of those bombings from happening. We'll always be caught off guard. We'll never, you know, and this is a couple years ago, obviously. We'll never, we'll never be ready. And this is what it said. It said, but what these things show is, this was Mark Wahlberg talking and Peter Berg, the director, talking. They said, they said, but what they show is that love can't be stopped. 
stories of those who lost their legs and those who were you know, affected by this and everything else. They're stories of love. What they were saying was is that no matter how many times people are bombed or killed or whatever else happens, that you can't stop people loving each other. In the, in, the, in the marathon bombing, what happened was people didn't run away from the bombs. They ran towards it. They had no way of knowing there were not any more bombs after the first two went off. After the first one, the second one off, probably everybody probably thought maybe there's a third one for sure when two of them went off. They show all this stuff, them running towards the victims, people taking out, ripping their shirts off, wrapping it around legs and arteries and everything else and blood everywhere, everything else, and people didn't run away. That's living in love. Hate, destruction, death, fear can never overcome love. It may seem like that, but it can't. And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying that, that living in love and moving in love is marked by healthy communication that is an embodiment of love, of being involved in unity, even when we disagree, when we don't understand one another, when we differ. Remember the two groups he brought together and they are hostile towards one another and yet he still called them to live in love. And we're also reminded the stakes are high for the battle is against cosmic powers. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, principalities in this particular text against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so when you read this, you, it's the Star Wars thing. It's the Star Wars question. It's ultimate good versus ultimate evil. You know, Star Wars is all about a morality play. It's all about new mythos. It's all about the whole idea of, of building legend. And these two massive forces that are at battle with, you know, this understanding there's something good and evil in everyone that has to be fought for one way or the other. I don't know how you feel about evil, how you feel about Satan or the devil or anything like that, and however you feel about that, there's a wide spectrum of that. But this is one thing I do know about all of that, no matter what. Whether I believe in personification of evil as some kind of Satan with a pitchfork and pointy ears and that sort of thing, which hopefully you don't believe in that at all, because that's totally outside the realm of anything. Or Dante's infernal understanding of the devil and Satan. You go back, you can look at all kinds of stuff. Here's what I do know. Evil does exist in the world beyond what we understand. We see it too many times in people, in situations, in governments, in countries. And that evil that exists... It's easy in the face of the language of cosmic powers to use this passage justification to say, you know what? I'm not going to be doing anything with this world because this world is so evil. I'm not going to have anything to do with it whatsoever. I'm going to focus on the spiritual world. And that our concern is not with this world, but the spiritual forces of darkness. And maybe that's true on one realm and one level, but it doesn't give us a right or a responsibility or a way out to allow the world just to be evil. For marginalized voices who are silenced, it's important to see that evil exists in our society through our culture and through our government. If you think that racism doesn't exist anymore, you're wrong. It may not exist around you or your circles, but it exists across the spectrum. It exists in the little jokes that we say about people of other races and nations. And we let him fly. It exists in our uncle, who is obviously a bigot, growing up in the South in the 50s and the 40s. It exists in the, in the idea that somehow we're not all equal. It exists in the biracial child. It exists in looking at people differently because of what they look like or how they dress or who they are. That's evil. It exists in our systems, too. That's what's called structural sin. Structural sin is that sin that exists in any government organization, any group, anyone beyond just the individual, school systems, everything. How do you think things happen in larger organizations that nobody seems to care about, doesn't take any responsibility for? Because when you get an organization like the government or anything else, you can do lots of things in the name of someone else you would never do yourself. That's structural sin. My dad works in the VA hospital system for the last 35, 40 years, maybe more. 
the VA always gets tagged on the front paper about being a horrible place to be and horrible service and everything else, and I have no doubt about any of those pieces of it. What do you think makes it so that good people are stuck inside of a system they can't change? It's structural sin. People don't care. My dad cares. He cares every day. My dad's not in charge of making decisions. You see, all of that exists within our world and and what we do. And the powers and principalities Paul is speaking about are talking about spiritual ones, but he's also talking about the principalities of the world. Rome. He's, He's hating on Rome in these passages. And the fact that he doesn't like what happens through their power, through their systems and their domination and their oppression that affect real lives. And it's the same for us. We've begun to learn over the years that we couldn't trust the government in the 1960s and the early 70s. We no longer could trust presidents to make good decisions all the time. We no longer could trust that the FBI or the CIA or anybody else in the world. We don't trust our, our people who we say all the time, our politicians fall for all kinds of moral failures. We see teachers fall for moral failures. We see across the board people in every place you never expected to fall all of a sudden do. That is both spiritual and it's a physical reality. And we have to remember that so we can't just tune out. It can also be tempting in the face of a culture consumed with contentious, divisive debate to either give it up altogether, I'm going to be part of any of it, or to find justification in this passage for us how to engage one another. It's okay for us to put on the armor of God and then go out and beat everybody else up with our beliefs and our thoughts and everything else that we have to give to somebody else, like we see in our tweets, in our Facebook feed, in TV news shows, in radio broadcasts, or in print again and again and again. And we think it's just normal. If any of us in this place acted that way towards one another in this congregation, would that be normal? The things that you see in the world and how we treat one another? It wouldn't. And if I was a part of those conversations, we'd be having a discussion. But yeah, somehow we think somehow in the world it's okay. But here's a couple of notes of clarification that I think are helpful in steering us away from either path. Because the last thing we put on, or the most important, I would say, are these things. It says in verse 16, In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. A Roman shield in that day and time was almost the size of a man. Like the other shield that I have too. And they would actually use their shields to turn basically into a turtle so you could not get through them with their long spears sticking out. And arrows wouldn't get through or anything else, and they were ready for battle. Their shields were made of wood and leather, animal materials, and wrapped with iron around the whole outer edge. And those shields were were defensive. And then take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. See, the Word of God here is described in terms of an offensive weapon, but a sword... That's not really what it's really talking about, like this sword, like it's going to be an offensive, I'm going to slash you to death with the word of God. If you're doing that to somebody because you think that somehow the scripture backs you up in doing that, it does not. Because because it's important to remember that we have already been reminded that Christ is the one true word of God, and that one true word is love. Go back to John. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word of God, the Logos, Jesus, the Incarnate, was the Word of God. The Word of God is not a Bible. The Word of God is Jesus, the founder of all love, the basis of all love for us. If it's not of love, it is not of God. It is not of Jesus. And so we must also speak the truth in love, like we talked about and learned in week two when we lived in love. That was a big piece. You're not speaking the truth in love to someone when you say to them, I need to speak the truth in love to you, and then you tear them apart. That is not speaking the truth in love. You must have relationship with someone to speak the truth in love, first and foremost. 
And then you can talk about hard things, but you should always remember to consider that the person is more important than whatever it is you're trying to say. Jesus never talked like that. Was he talking to someone he couldn't get through to? One writer says this, Any armor, including the armor of God, is useless without a sword. For the enemy can keep attacking until the armor gives way. How important then it is to be acquainted with the sword of the Spirit. And the sword of the Spirit is Jesus, the Word of God. And going back to verse 13, which you probably thought I just left out, probably the most important one. I'm all over the place in this sermon because it makes more sense how this is worked out. Look at verse 13. It says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand is mentioned four times in this text. Four times in this short passage. And here's the thing that made me think about this. We think sometimes that standing is passive. That somehow just standing around is just is passive, and maybe it is in that case, but standing can also be really important. After you've had surgery, especially on your knees or your hips, something like that, standing is vitally important. You have to be able to stand. But the standing here rather signals the resolve to stay in battle rather than to flee. To stand your ground. To not give up and go back the other way. That was the Greek in in the military context of what was going on in the Roman context of that. And so to stand. And so there's a a whole thing of of phalanx of soldiers um, then. So the Greeks invented this first. Here's your little history lesson. Stay together. Okay. History lesson. The Greeks invented a new form of battle, which was all about creating this closed-in thing where they were next to each other, even closer than this, with their shields against one another like this. And they had spears that were about 10 to 15 feet long that were in front of them. So they're holding it so I could reach back to Krista probably with my spear. And then they would just stand there. And then they would wait. And then eventually what they would do is when they were called to march, they marched in step and just moved forward one block. Can you imagine shields? All you can see is shields and spears coming at forward one step at a time. Didn't run. And they just stood and waited for you. That's what he's talking about. This whole idea of standing. They're not, they're not passive, are they? They look very passive to you. And that's what he means. And so even standing firm implies engagement in listening and considering and discussing and debating rather than stubbornness, which is rigid and not focused on others. Most of what this passage, most of what passes in our culture for discussion or debate under the guise of somehow communicating with each other is grounded in unbending, stiff stubbornness. And in fact, embodies the very characteristics which we are are told to put away in verse 431, which says, put away bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander, and malice. Now you look at our world and its communication and tell me if you don't see all those things all the time from every political party, from our president, from his enemies, from everywhere along the board, all of those things happen all the time. But not so for us. And so it says in verse 13 of that same chapter, it says, standing in the full stature of Christ. It tells us, till we attain all that, to mature manhood, to measure the stature, to stand. And it says in that same chapter we already talked about, it says, how does that standing in Christ mean? It means by being in peace, in gentleness, in reconciliation. That's what it means to stand in Christ and forbearance and respectful communication no matter whether you agree with someone or not. That's what it means to stand. And it requires us to be prepared to walk and move in love. And so I thought there wasn't any better way to end this sermon series than with this, which is, I'm sure, very familiar to you. But it's, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. And no, Francis does not say it. 
And if you look at the links in uh, version, you'll see a whole article about there's nothing before 1912 even about it. I guess somebody needed to get the credit for it, so they gave it to Francis, and you can't find any graphics without Francis on it. But this is what it says. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. That's what it means to be and to live in love. If we're going to show our witness to the world, then these are the things we're supposed to be showing at all times and in everywhere. Paul makes that clear. This is what it means to live in love. Those things are so hard that Paul, and of course, through Jesus, asked us to do. It is so easy to act the way others act around us and not even realize that we're doing it because those are the rules that we understand. But this armor of God that we're called to put on is not offensive, not really defensive helps us understand that hopefully those things that we put on will help us to act that way. That if we're focused in on scripture, we're focused in on salvation, if we're focused in on forgiveness, if we're focused in on truth, if we're focused in on the gospel of peace, that we're going to act differently because we're so focused on those things inside of our hearts. That it becomes easier. And so the more that we are able to dive into those things and put more of that armor on, or at least a piece at a time, or, or greater pieces of it, Paul says the better off we're going to understand what Jesus did here. Which is give his life for us. Which very often we just take for granted, like, well, yeah, that was awesome. But what have you done for me lately? Well, here's the answer to that. He's done plenty for us lately. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, tries to do much more for us than we seem to comprehend, just in his broken body. And we forget that the Son of God would give his life completely for us and totally. Not even knowing who we even are. And yet he does this for us. So maybe we not forget those things when we think that our way is better when we think that Jesus possibly couldn't understand or even know what we're going through or could help us, may we realize that he does understand and know. And his presence with us is a means of grace whenever we ask. So I invite those coming forward to serve this morning to come forward as we bless these elements together. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you so much for the chance we have to come to this place in these moments. Thank you for the opportunity we have to live like you and to know the power of love first and foremost in our lives. Imbue these elements now with your presence and your power through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus Christ's name we pray.
invite you this morning to come and to receive this great gift of love, to know his presence, to think what it means to move, to put on the armor of God, and to go out and spread the good news you've received with those around you. Come forth, receive this grace this morning. Let's receive together. like for you to live in love and to move in love maybe it looks like this one less facebook post that hurts somebody else one less tweet that we accept as being okay one, one less news program we watch thinking that we're going to side with one person or the other maybe it's one less conversation in which we hurt somebody around us maybe it's one more conversation in which somebody walks away knowing that we love them those are all the things in our lives we got to think about when we're at the grocery store and in school and at work and at home and on the interstate 
and everywhere because it's not a certain path we're supposed to follow to find Jesus and to know what it means to live in love. It's to live in love on every path that we go. May you go on your path living in love to those around you. And may you know that you are loved yourself as well. Amen. Let's sing high key.